hello there. So today I'd like to have a look at ancient Egypt with you. A friend of mine kindly brought back this map when he went on a vacation to Egypt. It's of Luxor and Aswan. And here on the one side, you have the temple of Luxor, and on the other side, there's Western Thebes with the Valley of Kings and the Valley of the Queens. And if we turn it over, Again, we're here along the River Nile and we have here the city of Aswan and all the way in the south we have the High Dam and the Aswan Dam and Lake Nasser but I think before we have a closer look at these maps Let's have a bit of an overview of ancient Egypt because there's plenty of time to cover. Let's just take off this little cover here. we can have a look at these beautiful maps. Yeah, at the start and then again at the end of the book. So the history of Egypt starts an incredible about 12,000 years ago when the desert started to expand in this area and people started moving towards the valley of the river Nile. This is where some of the first cities were built and eventually about 5,000 years ago the first dynasties emerged. At the time Egypt was divided into Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt and Lower really just means the delta of the river up here so out into the Mediterranean and Upper Egypt was this entire part upstream Briefly turn this around. So all the way roughly to Aswan. And this is where you have the first cataract. Cataract basically means rapids. So it's an area of the river that's difficult to navigate. And then we have an area called Nubia. Nubia today is partly in Egypt and partly in Sudan, which we have here on the southern part of the map. To the east, we have desert, and to the west, we have a desert as well. So, this area here along the river was really quite well protected. Egyptians mostly had to defend themselves against people living further south and people living further north. 
either up here towards the Levant or maybe coming from the Mediterranean. So, like I said, Lower and Upper Egypt did not get along, but eventually the Upper Egyptian side won and the area was unified and that's when we speak of the First Dynasties. And we actually know the names of these early kings because the script already existed at the time and everything was written down. The first capital was located in this area here, those Memphis. So basically, right on the border between Lower and Upper Egypt. Maybe as a bit of a diplomatic gesture to both sides. But 4,700 years ago, we then speak of the beginning of the Old Kingdom. The old kingdom lasted about 500 years. That's when the pyramids were built here in Gizeh, next to Cairo. The pyramid of Cheops, Kefren, and Mykerinos, all from the 4th dynasty. You also have all the pyramids here in Saqqara, but it's really the ones in Gizeh that are famous and I think they actually are the tallest of um, all the pyramids that you have. You can see here that it was a common way to build at the time. Sometimes the, the ground couldn't support the weight of the structure and the pyramids would crumble. But these ones survived quite well. The Old Kingdom thrived for quite a while. You had a centralized government. Administration initially was closely tied with the royal family, but eventually was but more independent from the kings and queens. There was a lot of trade, for example, with the area of Punt in the south, probably Eritrea or Ethiopia, but we don't really know. Funnily, the Egyptians actually left us depictions of the king and queen of Punt, but they never wrote down how exactly to get there. So we don't really know where that land is. So, the government worked well. Trade was thriving. But eventually, things started to fall down. The government stopped working as efficiently and the administration kind of went back to local levels, which at times still work really well, but on a sort of Egyptian wide level, things didn't work out. There was civil unrest, there was hunger, and that was the end of the old kingdom. And we get to the first intermediate period. That lasted something like 50 to 100 years. And then we get to the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom is when the capital was first moved to Thebes, which we just saw, which is Luxor today, but eventually then went back north. And you might have seen this on this map. Next to the Nile, we have this huge oasis called Fayum. It used to be a large lake. It's a bit smaller these days. It's been drying up for quite a while. 
but this too here is fertile land. That was used at the time for the capital. The area is connected to the Nile, but the lake consists of groundwater. I didn't know this, but here in the Libyan desert, you actually do have a lot of water very, very deep underground that's in the stone. And that's why you have the different oases and some of the water is being pumped out. You can actually buy some of that as drinking water in Libya. One other thing that happened during the Middle Kingdom was that they created a shippable way through the first cataract and fortified the second and third one. There are five cataracts all together and then you get to where the blue and white Nile connect to form the main river. The Middle Kingdom lasted from about 4,200 years ago to about 3,700 years ago, so again about 500 years. And then again things start to decline and we have another intermediate period. This one again lasts about 100 years and then we get to the New Kingdom. That's from about 3,500 to 3,000 years ago. And the New Kingdom is when Egypt really starts to thrive. The area that the pharaohs rule over isn't just the Nile anymore. It goes all the way down to the fourth cataract in the south and north all the way to Syria. There's a lot of trade, they have connections with Assyria, with Canaans, with people in the Levant. The temples here are being built, which we're going to look at in a minute. So it's the time of Ramesses II, and you might also know Echnaton, the pharaoh who briefly moved to a sort of monotheistic religion but that didn't last and people went back to their old gods. The New Kingdom too came to an end eventually. We then have the Third Intermediate Period and that one already lasts 400 years. People from Nubia actually take over Egypt and rule as pharaohs, so things kind of turn the other way. And after that we get to the later period. From that point on, there's a lot of influence from further north, from the Greeks, the Persians, Romans eventually. Egypt becomes part of the empire of Alexander the Great and then of the Romans. But people still stick to the art that they have, to their gods. But sometimes they merge it with new styles. One of my favorite kind of Egyptian art is from the Ptolemaic period. So about 330 BC into the Roman period. And these are portraits that were placed on mummies. They're usually found in Fayum, in the dead, the oasis that we just saw. So a lot of them were found here. And they were often created during the lifetime of the people that they depicted. So they're probably very close to what people actually look like. And I just find them so beautiful and touching. This one, by the way, is in the Louvre today. 
Ça, c'est le département des antiquités égyptiennes. Just like a lot of other pieces of art and artifacts from Egypt that have made it into Western museums. That really kind of started with Napoleon. It triggered something called Egyptomania, where people became extremely fascinated with anything to do with Egypt. So, art, architecture, um, hairstyles, clothing. And this year in Vienna, for example, we are celebrating the 150th anniversary of the World Fair that was in Vienna in 1873. And something that was exhibited at the time were copies of these wall paintings here. They are from Bini Hassan, from a tomb. And you can still see the copies today. After the World Fair, they were transferred to the newly built Art History Museum where they're still exhibited in the Egyptian collection together with a lot of originals, of course. All right, let's have a look at the actual map. The fascinating part about Luxor and Thebes is that this was built and extended over a really long period. The rulers of the 18th dynasty had their capital here for about 200 years before they moved it back north. But people kept building and extending all the way into the Ptolemaic era. So, for example, here you can see there's a Ptolemaic temple right here. And while the stars that you see here are not unique to Luxor, you still have a complexity and a diversity that you hardly find anywhere else in Egypt. So again, we have the River Nile in the center. And easy to see that this is a map of the city as it looks today. Uh, we have a ticket office right here. We have a tourist ferry and separate from that a local ferry. You can also hire a donkey or a bicycle here on the side. On the eastern side we have this temple complex of Karnak and further south we have another temple called the Luxor Temple. Here in this part we have the great temple of Amun or Amun-Ra which was the main god in the pantheon. Here in Thebes, people worship a triad, 
together with Mut, which was seen as a mother goddess, um, a figure that later absorbed a lot of other female deities. And there's another small temple to Honsu or Konsu, who was possibly associated with the moon and signified the passage of time. He was seen as the son of Amun and Mut. But I don't think the temple is here on this map. You can also see that there is a sacred lake right here in the center of the temple complex. It was probably used for sacred rituals, um, possibly involving the pharaoh. And there is another one here in the temple of Mot, right here in the south. So there, there's an open-air museum in the complex, but some parts of it are closed off to the public as they haven't been restored yet. And let's see, there should be some pictures we can look through here. When you go inside, you have this great hall where there are 134 columns placed in 16 rows. They are 10 to 21 meters high and weigh up to 70 tons. Here we can see a picture of the sacred lake with some of the obelisks in the background. The obelisks, by the way, didn't just start getting moved abroad once this Egyptomania hit in the 18th, 19th century. There's one, for example, in Paris from that era. One is also in Rome, and that is from antiquity. So this fascination with them is also very old. This here is the obelisks of Hatshepsut, one of the female pharaohs. And what often happened with pharaohs once a new ruler took the throne, he would try to erase all signs of the previous ruler. In the case of this obelisk, it wasn't destroyed though, and neither were these signs on it. But rather it was covered inside a mantle. And that way it was actually very nicely preserved, even the color of the stone. So this would be the temple I mentioned earlier of Konsu. Another red chapel of Hachipsut. Alright, and then we already get to the necropolis of Thebes in the west. So we cross the Nile to the other side. This area was used as a necropolis 
for almost all of the pharaohs of the time between the 18th and 20th dynasty. And if you think back to the beginning, to the map with all of the pyramids, initially these pyramids were built in order to preserve the mummies, so the, um, the mortal parts, the bodies of the pharaohs that were supposed to stay in this realm to function as a bridge between the mortals of this world and the underworld. However, even by the end of the Old Kingdom, a lot of the pyramids had been opened. So at this point, people figured, well, we might as well save ourselves the trouble. Let's go into these valleys here and hide the tombs in the stones. They are hidden, they can't be seen, they aren't as obvious as the pyramids and maybe they'll work a bit better. Unfortunately, it didn't. So for example, here in the Valley of Kings, a lot of the graves were opened and that, for example, the grave of Tutankhamun was still closed, was quite lucky. The pharaohs are often depicted with different gods that grant them their royal power. The grave of Tutankhamun was found by Howard Carter. You can see Carter's house right here. That was in 1922. Here in the Valley of the Queens, we don't just have queens that were buried there also princes and princesses. There are 91 tombs plus 19 little more hidden on the sides. And this was used up to the Roman period. And after that, during the Coptic period, up to the 7th century, Christian hermits were hiding in there. In the main area we have the Ramesseum, we have a temple of Tutmosis the fourth, Amenophis the second, another Ramesside temple, Seti the first and Ramses the second. There's the temple of Hatshepsut next to a hot air balloon station. Maybe I can show you a picture of that as well. Right there. I find this such a fascinating structure with these ramps up onto the terraces. And I mentioned earlier the land of Punt. It's depicted here how the Egyptians went to Punt, just not where they went. And this is where we can see king and queen of the country. We also have, when you move towards the area right here, the Colossae of Memnon, which are these two large statues. They look quite damaged by now. 
In fact, they got damaged a long time ago, around 2,000 years ago when there was an earthquake. And one of them was damaged in a way so that it would expand and close with the temperatures. And because of that, in the morning when the wind moved through, it sounded like it was singing, or rather mourning. People at the time thought it sounded like the goddess Eos mourning for her fallen son, Memnon. And that's why they're called the Colossae of Memnon. So here we have Aswan. Like then the southernmost city of Egypt. Like I said, it was built by the first cataract, which would have been just south of this area. It was fortified at the time in order to defend the border to Nubia. But there was also a lot of trade, so it was an important city. And in order to get from here all the way north to Lower Egypt to, for example, Alexandria, it would have taken 21 to 28 days, so three to four weeks. There's also this island here, the Elephantine Island, where you had so-called nilometers. So these were structures that led down to the water, so you could measure the clarity and the water level. People were dependent on the Nile and the yearly floodings. And so they wanted to check the quality of the water and how much there was. And the floods also brought with them a kind of fertile black soil that gave the country its name at the time. Kalmet, which means black soil. And there's also a museum here. And you could find the temple of Kum, a ram-headed god of the cataracts that guarded and controlled the waters of the river. The area has been protected by the UNESCO since the 60s. At the time, the dams were being built and Lake Nasser was created. And in order to preserve the artifacts that are located further south, such as Abu Simbel, they were placed under protection and then raised further up away from the water. The first time I heard that Cleopatra actually lived closer to our time than to the time when the pyramids were built. I couldn't believe it. But there's really so much history here. A 
along the river and so much really really beautiful art tells us a lot about the way people lived at the time. <laughs> Alright, I think for today that's enough. I hope you sleep well and I will see you again after our summer break in September. Thank you for watching and for sticking with us on this channel. Looking forward to seeing you again.